Hello, this is Joseph Zoto. Today's video is on who really pays customs duties. I felt it was important because there was a good deal of misinformation out there. We have people saying that the customs duties are a tax on a foreign country that they have to pay in order to be able to sell their products in the United States, which is false. And some people have even said the foreign country sends somebody over here to pay the duties on behalf of the U.S. buyer, and those companies are pouring billions of dollars into the U.S. Treasury, which is also false. There are billions of dollars of customs duties, but they're usually paid by the U.S. company. So today we'll eliminate the false information and replace it with the true information. Today's video is in three parts. The first part is we address the basic question. The second part is we'll dig into some exceptions. There will always seem to be exceptions. The third part is getting into the weeds on customs duties. And that isn't for everybody. It's a technical aspect that not everybody needs to go this deep. Feel free. But it is of importance to you if you work for a company that imports and exports, even if you're not in the part of the company that is involved, because opportunities may open up for you in the future. And having a basic, basic knowledge of customs duties is only going to help you. It's not going to hurt you. Likewise, if you're a business major or if you're an MBA candidate, even if you don't plan on working for a company that does anything internationally, you don't know what lies ahead, either with another job or for the years ahead. Or if your company decides to go international, your basic knowledge of customs duties will give you a certain advantage in getting involved in the part of your company that is expanding that will be closed to others. So if you fall into those categories or you just plain want to know a lot more than the first two parts, feel free. But I have to emphasize we're talking about a very complex area and we're doing it in a short video. So great oversimplification. So anything I don't directly say, don't assume because we won't cover all the details, we won't call, cover all the exceptions, and we won't get fully into the weeds even in part three, just by time constraints. Glad you joined me today. As you see behind me, I have some books for sale. In the description below, I have the link to Amazon. My books are available in Kindle as well as in paperback. And if you want, you can also buy me a coffee. So with those first steps, let's delve in. The person responsible for paying the customs duty is the U.S. importer of record. That is usually the person who is the buyer, who is the importer, and when they file their customs entry with Customs and Border Protection, they become the importer of record. They are responsible that the documentation is done correctly. They are responsible the duty is paid in full and on time, as you would expect, not the foreign seller. Customs and Border Protection, under the law, wants an importer of record who has a presence in the United States. So if something goes sour, they can go call on the person, get it corrected. If there's a fraud, somebody is misrepresenting the value of the merchandise or misclassifying it for the wrong duty rate, they want to be able to go after that person legally if they have to. And there are fines and other penalties involved for customs violations, as you would expect. And if a company's only location is, say, in China, well, Customs and Border Protection doesn't have the necessary authority in China. So that's why it has to be somebody in the United States. So in many cases, a foreign company that you might buy from is incapable of ever being the importer of record in the United States because they're not here. Or typically, my rule is if I'm responsible for something I'm in control over, which means I want to pay the duty, I want to file the documents, I want to be in charge of what I'm responsible for and make sure that it's done properly on my behalf as well as my company, because individuals can get into trouble too if something is misrepresented. So there's the incentive. So as a U.S. company, we're out to buy a product from China, and we're going to buy 1,000 units at $1 each for a total price of $10,000 XWorks, abbreviated EXW. Now, that is a term of sale that simply means the price of the goods on the shipping dock at the factory, the warehouse, the initial shipping point that the goods will be moving international from, not the dock at the pier. XWorks is a term in Incoterms. We are now on the Incoterms 2020 version. I will put a link below to where you can purchase the book if you want from Amazon. 
Um, however, if you're just a little curious, you will probably find that your public library has a copy in the reference section that you can just flip through and get an idea of what it's about at this point. The U.S. rules are different from the international ones. They are in the Uniform Commercial Code. The code has been adopted in slightly different versions by every state, but the terms of sale are pretty much the same. They have to be because we do do so much shipping interstate. So that can be found at your state law library, which probably has your state statutes available online for you. So you can check those out too. Now, the reason I bring this up here and now is not only because the international rules and the U.S. rules are somewhat different, but both sets of rules use the initials FOB for free on board, but they mean different things, different things. A lot of money has been lost. A lot of sales have been lost. There's been a lot of frustration in U.S. companies trying to do an international transaction, FOB, and not understanding that it's not the same as our domestic definition. So that's something of a slight digression, but I think it's important to cover. What X works is the price of the goods to the buyer right there on the dock, ready to ship out from the producer's location without anything being done to it, no transportation to any place, no duty being paid. The price of the goods, $10,000. 1,000 units at a dollar a piece, $10,000. And we can arrange our own transportation here, do our customs entry, and pay our duty. Why would the foreign seller want to pay the duty for us? Let's say it's 10% or $1,000. They're simply going to reduce their profit by $1,000 unless they increase the price. So the odds are they'll say, fine, the price is $10,000, X works, and if we send over the money for you to pay your duty, the price is $11,000. First, we have to collect it from you, and then we'll send it back to you to pay the duty. So it's all convoluted. Also, they may charge you $1,200 because, see, now they have extra steps to do, so they want to charge out their employees' time to you and maybe even make a little bit extra profit on this part of the transaction. So for everybody's convenience, it is generally a better idea to purchase on a term of sale that does not include the foreign seller getting involved in customs clearance or duty payment here in the United States, or for you, if you were an exporter, to get involved in customs clearance and duty payments in another country with another language and somewhat different procedures. The seller should take care of export clearance shipping the goods out of the country legally according to that country's laws, an export license if needed. And the buyer should be responsible for handling the import as import of record, documentation, customs inspection, payment of duty should be entirely on the part of the buyer. That's how it works officially. So that's how it works almost all the time. The answer to the question then of who pays the duty is going to be initially the import of record, which will usually be the U.S. company. Let's say a U.S. company is purchasing some shirts. They bring them in. They file entry. They pay the duty. And they put them into the stores. They have to cover their costs in order to be able to sell the merchandise to the consumer. So for everybody's convenience and in the best interest of the importer who is responsible for the documentation being correct and the duties being paid in full and on time, is to let the seller take care of the export clearance from the foreign country Perhaps an export license is needed. It can be very difficult for the buyer to take that step in a foreign country. So to avoid all these convoluted steps and extra costs, it's best for the buyer in the United States to handle the import clearance himself and be the importer of record. So if the duty on the product is 10% and we have $10,000 worth of product, then we expect to be paying $1,000 in duty. And we will just pay it to Customs and Border Protection when we make our entry and everything should go smooth. So the U.S. buyer has an incentive to say, I will take care of the customs clearance and I will take care of the payment of duty when it gets here. Simple, no complications, everything goes in a straight line, should work efficiently. Let's not put complications into it that we don't need and will possibly cost us more money. Now, if we're importing, we want to resell the product at a profit. So we have to be able to cover the cost of goods, the transportation here and the duty in our sale to our customer in order to be able to make a profit. So no matter how the duty got paid, ultimately the U.S. consumer is going to pay for it. It's in there someplace. So the idea that a foreign company would come over and pay the duty out of their pocket 
is not a reasonable expectation, and no foreign country has to pay a duty to be allowed to bring their goods into the United States. Essentially, the importer of record is the individual or company that brings the goods into the United States. So, exceptions. Suppose the duty rate on an imported product goes from 10% to 20%. The U.S. importer has been incented to raise his prices in order to be able to still make the same profit he was making before, covering that additional duty. But in some cases, the importer may keep his price steady in order to not overprice himself in his domestic market, be able to stay competitive and say, I'd like to sell as much product as I can, even if I'm making a little bit less money on it, I will come out ahead than if I raise my prices and sell less product. Sometimes the cost may be passed on to the retail store and they may absorb the extra cost, be able to make it more affordable for the consumers. But it is not unusual for the cost to simply be passed on. Taking this model it is also not impossible for your foreign supplier to agree to reduce his price by the amount of the duty to help get into your U.S. market. So $10,000 worth of goods, $1,000 worth of duty, they lower the price to $9,000. In a way, they're paying the duty. They're really giving you a discount enabling you to keep the money in your pocket in the first place to be able to pay the duty. So another exception, suppose we have a car company in Germany that ships to their company here in the United States, their distributor that they also own. And that is the company that sells to dealerships, which are usually franchises. So the distributor here would be the importer of record. They would be responsible for the payment of duty and they can take it out of their checkbook and uh, pay the duty. But since they're related parties, it's not that difficult for the German company to send the wired money over to the United States to the distributor, say, here is the duty money, we're subsidizing you, and you'll be able to make your entry with this money that, uh, that you now have in your account. So in essence, Germany is paying the duty to be paid in the United States. Customs and Border Protection does not care where the money originally comes from, as long as it's paid in full and on time. But the Internal Revenue Service does, and the German tax authorities will. So if you're dealing with a related company that would like to have the exporter forward the duty money to the importer of record, it affects the books of the company, the financial statements, and hence the tax returns. So if we have a large shipment of cars, and let's make it a million dollars worth of duty. If the U.S. company pays the duty of a million dollars, that comes off its profit. And so its profit is somewhat less and its taxes are going to be somewhat less. If the German company forwards the money over, the U.S. company does not lose that million dollars. It just got the million dollars to pay the duty with, but the German company now has an additional million dollar expense that reduces its taxes in Germany. The income tax services take a very close look at related parties in the first place, where there's common ownership of cross borders. And there are lots of companies like that. And if they are buying and selling between them and it affects duty, they take a close look with the magnifying glass. So we're getting into some technical things here. Now we'll go even further, right into the weeds. Here we have an excerpt of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States for 2024. This is where we find our duty rates. The link is on the description below. On this particular excerpt, this page is from Chapter 16. It is heading 1601, subheading 1601.00, and is sausages and similar products of meat, meat offal, blood or insects, well, everything has to be in here someplace. Food preparations based on these products. And here we have them of pork. 1601.00.20 is the tariff rate suffix, and the tariff is the same for all such products, depending on the country of origin and depending on how it might follow the rules of origin, which we'll get into in a few moments. The product is either canned, statistical suffix 10, or other statistical suffix 90. We report how much we're bringing in on our customs entry by kilograms. So we have two possible harmonized tariff schedule of the United States numbers here, 
1601.00.20.90. We have to have the right classification. Here we have our duty rates. Column two, column one, column two, at this time, consists of Cuba, North Korea, Russia, and Belarus. So we are not likely to be big importers from any of those four countries at this time. And I, I should say too, it's the country of production, not the country that you're importing from necessarily. Uh, something could be made in Germany and you buy it from an exporter in the Netherlands and you bring it into the United States, it would still be a German product. So the country of origin is really the country of production. Everybody else is in column one. We'll start in the general column, which is 0.8 cents per kilogram. That is the duty rate here. As you see further down, we have duty rates also by percentage. This is a specific duty. This is an ad valorem duty or on the value duty. Our footnotes here give us cross references to look at some other classifications that might apply to our product so we don't miss something. So if everybody else is in the general column, what's the special column about? That's the exception to the general column. Those are the free trade agreements and such. IL is products that meet the rules of origin for the U.S.-Israel free trade agreement. JO is the U.S.-Jordan agreement. S stands for the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which used to be called NAFTA. So if everybody else is in column one, what can be a classification that, that the general rate doesn't apply, but the special rate does, which as you see here is free under certain conditions. That's if they meet the rules of origin for a particular kind of product under a particular trade agreement or trade concession. The U.S. Israel Free Trade Agreement, J.O. is U.S. Jordan. S is what is now called the U.S. Mexico Canada Agreement, which used to be called NAFTA, but underwent a name change in 2018. It is worth looking into the history of that a little bit. There were some people some years back who said NAFTA was a terrible treaty to the disadvantage of the United States and President Clinton was wrong to negotiate the treaty. In the first place, the treaty was negotiated in 1992 under President George H.W. Bush. It was shepherded through the Democratic Congress in 1993 under Democratic President Bill Clinton. So we had the Republicans and Democrats working together in a bipartisan manner to get this agreement through. The people who have said NAFTA is a horrible treaty detrimental to the United States have never been able to point out to me what that horror is, why it is so terrible. Although, yes, some companies benefited because of NAFTA and some companies were hurt because of NAFTA. So, for example, copper mined in Mexico qualifies under NAFTA. It comes in duty free. Here in Arizona, copper is a major mining commodity. The mining companies would really rather have not have duty free copper coming into the United States and be more competitive with their commodity. In Detroit, a lot of copper is used in the manufacture of automobiles. The folks in Detroit would rather see anything that would make copper less expensive to bring in and turn into the products that they need to finally assemble, assemble the car. So, there's always controversy, but what's terrible about it, the people who said it was so terrible met in 2018 and essentially made the name change and left everything else the way it was. The rules of origin are the same as they were in 1994. The preference criteria are the same as they were in 1994. There have been some tweaks every two years. The United States did not call this meeting to rename NAFTA. It is the biannual meeting of all three countries that's been held every two years since 1994. And in 2018, the agenda of the administration at the time was to do a name change and make it into the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, which was important to them. There were no major changes to the actual agreement itself. Let me point out, too, that if you exported to Mexico certifying a product qualified under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, and it really didn't, after the U.S. Customs and Border Protection catches up with you and is ready to start charging you fines, they will also notify Mexican Customs that there was an invalid certificate issued. Then 
Mexican Customs is going to go after the Mexican importer and demand the duty and then go back several years demanding duty plus interest. They normally don't charge any penalty because it wasn't their fault. They went according to the certificate that you created and you provided. So they did not intentionally do anything wrong. They did not negligently do anything wrong. But the statutes and the agreement still make the Mexican government collect the past due duty and the interest from the data was supposed to be paid to the duty where it's finally paid. Guess who they're going to come to for reimbursement of that duty? They are going to come to you and say, we have been importing this product from you for the past year, and now we owe $30,000 duty that you said we wouldn't have to pay because it qualified under the agreement. Since it didn't qualify under the agreement, we would like you to reimburse us the $30,000 that we shouldn't have had to pay in the first place. So, whole can of worms there. It is a complicated system. Internationally, the system is six digits. Most countries that we will trade with are part of the harmonized tariff schedule internationally. Some of the less developed countries are not. So the first six digits are going to be uniform no matter where you go. In our example here, that's our 1601.00. After that, individual countries can do whatever they feel like doing. So we decided to go to 10 digits. Mexico uses eight digits. Therefore, it is impossible for a Mexican and an American company to be working with their harmonized tariff schedules and ever come up with the same number. It's impossible. Canada uses 10 digits, but they have arrived at their particular system independently of what the United States does. As the United States came up with our system independently of what Canada does. Here we see the corresponding Canadian page, but as you see, 1601.00.20.10 and 1601.00.20.90 simply do not exist in the Canadian tariff. So even though there are 10 digits and the numbers look very similar, it's very rare that they are exactly the same. Sometimes it will occur, but usually the numbers are going to be different. So this is a trap with any other country that uses 10 digits to watch out for. We'll focus on Canada. You're going to be buying some product from Canada. The Canadian exporter puts the harmonized tariff schedule number on the invoice. You may be tempted to say, well, they've already classified. It's their product. They must know what they're doing. So we'll just use the same number here. And your entry will be rejected, and you'll have a penalty for misclassifying your entry because you're putting in a number that does not exist in the United States. Same reverse if you put a U.S. harmonized tariff schedule number on your invoice and send it into Canada, they use that number, they're going to have a problem. So we want to be sure to always do our own classification. So essentially, I am against putting a harmonized tariff schedule number on any invoice or any document that goes directly to your importer at the other side. They should do their own classification into their own system. So while today's video has given you some information on duties, and if you've gotten this far, you know more about customs duties than most people in the United States, including at least one candidate for president of the United States, and many, many people who are really importing and exporting and are doing things like negligently prepared U.S., Mexico, Canada certificates of origin, misclassifications, things like that. So you're already way ahead of a lot of people. As a practical matter, if you're going to be doing importing or exporting, and we're not getting into it today, but on exporting, the harmonized tariff schedule still has a function in how you declare your goods out of the country. We won't dwell on that today. Best thing to do is get as knowledgeable as you can, but to get expert help. Remember that I said we used to do one-day seminars just on the harmonized tariff schedule? Rules of interpretation, rules of origin of NAFTA slash U.S. Mexico Canada Free Trade Agreement. Uh, there is a lot to this, and there are a lot of traps. So I will tell you one. We used to do this as a quiz. Here comes an emergency shipment of chicken fat in a 55 gallon drum air freight. What is the proper classification? Now, the first thing we tell our students is get rid of the information that is extraneous. The fact that it's rush or it's in a 55-gallon drum, 
uh, the fact that uh, it's coming air freight has nothing to do with the classification. And sometimes students will tell me, well, now wait a second, we can't do this. You didn't tell us what the value was. I said, I didn't ask you for the duty. I asked you for the classification. You can classify it without knowing what the value is. So you see how we try to test people if they were really paying attention or anything that. And most people will misclassify. They will go into chapter 16, which we just examined part of, not find it, and decide, well, it's like a chicken park. So they classify it that way. However, there is a completely different chapter that includes fats and edible oils, which includes vegetable oil and chicken fat. So there are a lot of ways in which the harmonized tariff schedule, because it's so specific, can trick you. Now, just look at those pages. You're also not going to pick this up from online. When we used to use paper copies, hard copies of the harmonized tariff schedule, we had two separate loose leaf books, and each one was, I'm guessing now, about seven, eight hundred pages. But it took two volumes to contain the entire harmonized tariff schedule of the United States in a way that you could handle it on your desk. So there's a lot there. Best person to talk to on uh, customs duties and other import procedures before you get started is a licensed customs broker. Customs broker in the United States must have a license. That is not true in all countries. They are to be the experts on finding your entry, figuring the duty, doing the classification, sending someone down to open up the cartons of customs wants to do an inspection, all of that. That is their specialty. You have your own business. You should know something about customs duties, import procedures, export procedures if you're doing that. But you do not have to develop the expertise. You have experts available. Your local Customs and Border Protection office will give you a list of the licensed customs brokers doing business in your port. And when I say port, that's not necessarily a seaport. Des Moines is a customs port. Omaha, Nebraska, and that's a place where customs has an entry station, we'll call it. So that is the easiest way to get a list of brokers. The licensed customs broker in the United States passes a test on the customs regulations, which we haven't covered, such as marking regulations and such, and on the harmonized tariff schedule. There are 80 questions, and you have four hours for the test, which sounds like plenty of time, but you've only got about three minutes per question. And some of those questions involve fairly complex duty calculations with shipments containing several different and unrelated products all in one shipment. So you've got to do multiple classifications, figure multiple values. Well, you get the idea. It's a test to see if you've really got it. So a licensed customs broker has passed that test and gone through a character investigation by customs who will talk to your employer and talk to your neighbors and check with IRS to make sure you paid your taxes and all of those things because you're going to be handling money in large amounts for duties on behalf of your client. So both steps are very important. Passing is 80 and it takes about a year to go through the procedure from the time you pass the test to the time you actually have the license on your wall. So these folks have been through it, and they do it every day for all kinds of different importers with all kinds of different merchandise. So you've got experience there. Some companies will be very local, and um, the business will be uh, simply in your area. Some companies are national and international companies that may have licensed customs brokers in a dozen cities in the United States. So call around. See who you feel comfortable working with. If you're on the export side, the person you need is a freight forward. And somewhere in there, we need a carrier to move the freight from point A to point B. Good news. There are some companies that offer all three services. So you can hire a company that can do the freight forwarding, can handle the transportation here, and clear customs here. But I caution, try not to get involved in a situation where a U.S. company that you're paying for is responsible for being the freight forwarder on the other side. Purchase it on a term of sale where a foreign supplier is going to hire a freight forwarder to do whatever expo clearance is necessary so you don't get mixed up in that. So that's my advice to you there. Try to avoid it. If you are dealing with a related party, it's not so important. I mentioned about the tax situation, but as far as the communications and the flow of traffic, it can work a lot better if you are dealing with 
one company to handle your cargo from your company's location A in one country to your company's location B in another country because you have everybody in one company talking to each other. So that's some advice for you on that. Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope you found today's program interesting and informative, even if you're not doing importing and exporting right now. That would dispel some misinformation and give you some good technical information for the future and some warnings about, uh, well, brain surgery self-taught isn't a good idea either. So we have specialists available for you in this country. So give us a like and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and click the notifications bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Thank you for joining me today.